going to be an unusual uh, message, I think, today. Uh, I remember Don Ingram was often asked to preach certain topics or subjects that seem relevant to the church at different times, and, and he, would, uh, he would say the same thing. He'd say, I'm preaching through books of the Bible, and when the topics show up, that's when I'm going to speak to it. But I'm not going to decide ahead of time, these are the subjects I'm going to speak to. Well, that would, um, that would fall into this category. This could be a tough one, uh, if not for the fact that it just happens to be here. So if there is any offense by any of us, it is, uh, that, would be, that would be the Lord doing it and, uh, and nobody else. Uh, chapter 22, it's an entire chapter to a very unusual story. You remember how chapters 1 to 5 were preparation to cross over the Jordan and take the land. And then 6 to 12 was the actual conquering and taking of the land. And then 13 to 24, the whole end, the whole last half of the book was the actual distribution of the land. And we see that it gets taken care of there. If you look at the last part of 21, the last part of 21 says, thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that God, the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. That is a wonderful breather. Whew, it's all done. We have finally gotten this thing taken care of. And then we immediately have a problem arise in chapter 22 a pretty major problem that nearly led to a civil war. Uh, the swing of mood here where everything is great, everyone has their land, all the promises have been made and fulfilled, we all get to rest and everything's good. And then 22. Immediately there is a major conflict in misunderstanding. And I want us to catch today, the idea and the message today is that the problem happened was that somebody heard something and they passed it on to somebody else. We don't even know who they are, and then somebody acted on it, and we nearly caused a civil war. There is an incredible amount of power in gossip. There is an enormous amount of consequence to passing on information that is not verified, and then, even if it is verified, taking it to the wrong people. And it explodes. And then it nearly divides and destroys two and a half tribes of Israel. And right at the very end, the right people are standing in front of the right people, and the Wrong accusations are being made, and they were able to defend themselves with passion, defend themselves, and fortunately convince that what they're saying wasn't true, and then everyone rested. So take a look at you would to Joshua 22. I'm assuming this Snickers is for Neil because he loves Snickers. Honestly, I'm like, like, was there any chance? I mean, I'm leaving my phone. I swapped them. <laughs> he can have my stupid phone. The Snickers is going with me. Okay, and this is wobbly. What's going on? I'm OCD, and there is no way. Oh, yeah, there it is. Much better. Yeah, that's it. No, that's good. Normally, I'd take napkins off the table and shove that under there. Oh, I see. Oh, oh just turn to Joshua 22. It's just, it's just going to be a, just going to be a terrible day. It is. It's not mine. (laughs) 
sorry, Pastor Neil. I know where your Snickers is, though. <laughs> okay, follow the movement of this. Uh, okay, okay, let's, let's, let, I was going to tell you to focus. No, <laughs> there's one person in the room needs to focus right now, and I believe that's me. Okay. At the time when Joshua summoned the Reubenites, you're going to get tired of this phrase, Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Those are the two and a half tribes that had land on the east side of the Jordan River. And the deal was, though, when they decided they wanted that land, Joshua said, yeah, good try. You want this land because we just got it, and you want to stay here while the rest of us go over the Jordan to the west side and take all of that. No, you two and a half tribes can have this land, but you have to go with us until all the land is conquered And once it's all conquered and you've played your part, we'll let you go back to the east side to your land. So here it is. The Reubenites, the Gadites, half-tribe of Manasseh, said to them, this is Joshua said, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days, down to this day, but you have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only, I love this, this is so Joshua, only be very careful to observe the commandment of the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. This is so Joshua-like and as a parent, this should be parent-like and grandparent-like. He literally said, hey, I'm thrilled you got a new house. That's terrific. Go move in. It's beautiful. Hang pictures. But only be very careful to observe the commandment of the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. To love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, keep his commandments, cling to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. You go to school on Monday morning, and you fight the traffic and go to work on Monday morning. Hope it's a good day. You have appointments, and you have different things and projects that you have to get done. Only be very careful to observe the commandments, the law of Moses, servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord, your God, walk in all his ways. Keep his commandments. Cling to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Do you see that wonderful focus? It wasn't about the land. Hey, go, you earned it. You were faithful. Take the land. But listen to me. You better obey God. Serve him and love him with all your heart, soul, and mind. It's that important. It's always the premier top subject for Joshua. It's not about the land. It's not about where the land is. It's about serving God, which is why the conflict arose. Now to the one and a half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan. But to the other half, Joshua had given possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan. That's how the tribe was split. And when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, go back to your tents with much wealth, with livestock, silver, gold, bronze, iron, clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. And then take a look at verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. And this, this, this is it, verse 11. And the people of Israel heard it said, Behold, the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. 
This is disastrous. So as the two and a half tribes are making their way east, right at the Jordan River, but it says on the Israel side, a massive altar. And it was impressive. Massive altar was built. Well, Shiloh is where they were sacrificing. So Shiloh was the, was the Jerusalem that we know of. It would be Shiloh. Shiloh was the place where the, the tent of meeting and where the altar and the sacrifice took place for about 400 years, from about 1400 or so to time of David when they decided that Jerusalem was going to be their place and they built at the Temple Mound site, which is what we look at today as the place for sacrifice. Before that, it was Shiloh. And they gathered at Shiloh, and they looked over, and they saw that a massive altar was being built. And when the people heard about it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war. I want to point one thing out in verse 11. It is in your notes. Whenever there is a group of people together there is somebody who wants to be the one that says something. This is an entire civil war built on, and the people of Israel heard it said. They heard it said. I, I don't have no idea who. I don't think they knew who. But the heard it said is what led to in a massive response. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war. They don't know who said it. And it stopped me in thinking. We pass information so fast. And you look up gossip in the, in the uh, dictionary, and so often we erroneously think that gossip is passing information that we don't know to be true or that is false. That's true, but that's not, you don't have to look to definition two or three. Within the very definition, it's passing on information about somebody else that is, should not be passed. That's what it is. You have no reason to know that. But they chose to tell you that. And very often, this is so true, and it happened here, they tell you information that you should not know because, and I hate to be this, this hard on this subject, but they do it because they're a coward and they think that you'll act on it. They're using you. So if I could just kind of casually pass it on, who? now I'm done, you'll take care of it. Or we pass it on to lower the view of that person, the estimation of that person in other people's eyes. You look at all the reasons why we pass on information under the guise of, I care about them, I'll pray for them, or whatever, the reasons why we're passing it on are negative reasons. They are not for upbuilding. And that's what we have here. And as I was thinking this through myself, I'm like, yeah, I, if you're in any type of leadership, you're used regularly or try to use you regularly to get you to do something. So I know I'm cautious when I hear something. Oh, did you hear they did this? And I go, really? Like, I need to take care of that. Rather than, oh, really? Well, did you talk to them about it? Because that has nothing to do with me. Well, they work for you. Yeah, a lot of people work for me. But I have nothing to do with that. Right? Right? Isn't that, isn't that some of the phrasing? It's, that has nothing to do with me at all. So, but as I thought this through, I had to be honest enough to stop and think and realize that the culprit, the person who said, the one who needs to be corrected is me. And it would be hypocritical of me to point to other people and say, you know who really needs to know this? 
No, the one who really needs to know this and think this through is me. Verse 12. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war. Then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and with him ten chiefs. That would be from the tribes, one from each tribe. Every one of them the head of a family among the clans of Israel. And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, in the land of Gilead, and they said... Now listen to where this has gone. Verse 16, listen what the accusation early on. The accusation was that they have built an altar. So they, they seemingly have an intent to offer their own sacrifices and have their own place of worship. That's, that's the accusation. So... They finally get face to face. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. Okay, that's, that's bold. Now we're speaking for everybody. Isn't that remarkable? Well, we heard it said. And then the congregation gathered. And now it's thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. Man, is that not the funniest thing? Now I'm, and I'm just going to sidetrack. It's back to like a Snickers thing is when they say, well, many of us. I love that line. I've got a concern. In fact, many of us do. And I go, no, please, tell me it's not many. I mean, that's just, that's a classic line to build the support. There's a lot of us. They're going to do this, 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 and this. Well, that's funny. It's one person in front of me Forget that. You're manipulating me. And that's what's happening here. The whole congregation of the Lord. And look at the, um, the accusations. What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? Have you not enough of the sin of pure from which then it talks about the sin of pure where Tens of thousands were killed. It's in Numbers. Uh, in verse 18, that you must turn away this day from following the Lord, rebel against the Lord today, and tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. But now if the land of your position is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands. Take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and make us uh, rebel uh, as rebels by building for yourselves an altar. They had this whole concocted thing going on that the look on those two and a half tribes' face, their eyes are huge. They're like, wow, we were doing that? Man, we are bad. I mean, it was all made up and figured out everything that was going on, and that's not what was going on. Now, a key problem I had in this text was with the word altar. Because they did not deny building an altar. And I go classic dictionary, altar means place for sacrifice. So they're going to claim they had no intent. And I thought, well, then why did you call it an altar if you had no intent? So you don't, my mistake was going to an English dictionary on the word altar. Where I needed to be was a Hebrew dictionary on the word altar. Because the word altar means witness. And as a witness, you can have direction. The altar, like you and I would think, where you'd sacrifice something, is a witness between man, woman, and God. That's the witness. That's an altar. They named it an altar because they named it a witness, and it's a witness between the two and a half tribes and the remaining tribes. It's still a witness. So the, the, the mix-up was not on the subject of altar. They knew that. 
But what they didn't understand was the value of what was actually being done. Because look in 24, then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, said in answer to the heads of the families, I love this, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows. And let Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings, may the Lord himself take vengeance. No, we did it for fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. And you people, Reuben, people of Gad, you have no portion in the Lord. So your children might take your children, cease to worship the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offerings, not for sacrifice, not to be a witness between us, between our generations after us, we do perform the service of the Lord in this presence of burnt offerings and sacrifice and peace offerings, so your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion with the Lord. It was a witness. The intent all along was, it is a witness to say, I'm building this because we're crossing over. It's interesting here at Palmcroft, if you look uh, geographically where we all live, We have a very, very small percentage that live on the east side of I-17. Very small percentage. Like you should win something. If Yes, I see that. I volunteer to win something. It's yours. Whatever The Snickers, grab it after church. (laughs) All right. One end is better than the other end, I'm just saying. Because it's a natural uh, barrier in people's minds. So they just don't cross unless they're super, super godly. Then they'll cross over it. Uh I know, I know. Okay, you know who you are. So they knew the same thing. When you cross over the Jordan, you're going to forget who we are. You're not even going to, you don't even remember. We're so far over, but we're going to build this massive altar so that your people, as they cut through this famous valley, that they'll see it, we'll see it, always keeping the two of us together. So the second point is to gracefully stop the one who said it. A passive, quiet, non-response is always interpreted as compliance. Good for them for going and asking, not good for them for going with such loaded sentences. We all know this. You don't go with, this is what I see, this is what you're doing, and this is what's going You say, hey, I saw a massive something or another. What is that? Have a little bit more tact in not repeating and embellishing. There's a great story. Uh, Brent Garrison's, I think, usually in this service. Yeah, oh, there he is. Great story, Brent. And I don't know if you remember this. Uh, my brother was uh, dean of students or something for you years ago, and a student leader went into uh, Dr. Garrison's office, who was president of uh, Arizona Christian University, and the student went in and sat with Dr. Garrison and said, hey, you know, there's kind of an issue uh, with, um, with Randy that I kind of want to talk through with you and kind of get some advice And Dr. Garrison said, yeah, that's a great idea. I'd love to do that. Hop up. And the kid kind of looked around, hopped up, and Dr. Garrison walked out of his office, and the kid's following behind and getting further and further behind as they're going down the hallway because he's catching on. And goes down to the end of the hallway, taps on Randy's door, and Randy says, yep. He goes, hey, Randy, uh, Chris here says he's got a problem with you. You don't mind figuring this out, do you? Do you mind talking this thing through? And Randy goes, oh, I would love to. Come on in. The kid's eyes were, I think, that big. But, right? Is that not great? So often we just sit and we don't listen. I mean, we don't respond. Well, a gossiper has to have one thing to succeed, a listener. You have to have a listener. 
or else it doesn't do anything. But we'll sit and we'll go, oh, yeah, later. I really disagreed with that. Did you say anything? Uh Uh-uh. No, but I really disagree with that. No, say something. Say, hey, that really isn't any of my business. But if you want, let's go call. I'll even go with you if you want, if you want to talk to that person. It's a great example. It was a great example for us. Third point is to get the whole story, which is what they finally did. They finally got the whole story, and I I can't imagine the conflict of the moment that you have these leaders on one side confronting these two and a half tribes that did a good thing. Isn't that true for you? You have done a really good thing, and then somehow you took a beating for it? Am I right? That happens to all of you. They built this beautiful altar that Israel would have just applauded and said, this is so good for us. Instead, they come get confronted, and they might actually get killed for it. It was that far off. Listen to things through. Hear the whole story. As I was looking again at this, and I want to end by going back to verse 22. I think there's great tips and great things about this that are helpful. But I love the way in uh, verse 5 and 6 that Joshua sent them off. Love God, keep his commandments. I really do like as well in 22, their first response, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows The mighty one God, the Lord, knows. He knows. Let Israel itself know it is within rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord. Do not spare us today. If we've done anything wrong, God, you know. I want to be okay with you. And my mind immediately went to 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I just, I, I took a step away from the text. And that's what I want to leave us with today. Whatever we do, and whether we're driving to work, and especially as we're talking and interacting with people, that we talk to the glory of God. Whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, does it bring glory to God? Hey, you guys, your your land is over there. Take it. Hey, thanks a lot. Oh, before you go, before you go, remember the commandment that Moses gave to us. Keep the word. Love God. Anything else I don't care, but do that. And ultimately for us, we have a savior. Our God sent Jesus Christ as our savior. There are no strings attached to that sent Jesus Christ to live a sinless life and he died as a sacrifice for every one of us. And then when we put our belief and trust in him, we then say, Lord, my life is yours. Everything I say, everything I do is to your glory. Lord, I'm sorry that I speak about people. Eliminate that from me. I want to love you and serve you. That I live my day tomorrow for myself. It's not for myself. I live it for you. I want to get good grades in school and college and get some, not for myself, but for you, God. I want to do it for you because I love you. And what a beautiful focus that we have in chapter 22 where it goes from near civil war to a great statement of trusting in God back to conflict as it swings back and forth to finally there's a unity in a love and a devotion to God. Let's pray together.